Hello and welcome to today's video. So this time we're going to be having a look through and cleaning my vintage Zephyr books, my Torchnitz editions, just a couple of those, um, my Muth and Six Pennies, which are a fantastic little series, and also my run of Toucan novels. So uh, these are all very, very ancient paperbacks. And uh, in some cases, I've had them for a few decades and never got around to giving them a proper systematic clean, which is exactly what we're going to be doing today. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and let's get to it. Okay then, so here's the first one. Saratoga Trunk, Edna Ferber. <laughs> this is a Zephyr. Now, first thing you notice about a Zephyr book, if you ever come across them, is they're really heavy. They're printed on super thick stock paper. You see the, you can almost see the thickness of each sort of page there compared to what would come later. So these sort of date from the early 1930s. In fact, we'll have a look and see if this one's actually got a date in it. Well, this one actually says 1945, so these are sort of this particular batch are post war ones. Uh, we do have some pre war ones as well to look at today, and a few that sort of came about um, in response to the penguins really being so popular, um, sort of color coded. In fact, these are a little bit color coded, but this is very, very nice. Um, and these were designed this continental book company, they were designed uh, to be sold throughout Europe. So it says down the bottom here. This edition must not be introduced into the British Empire or the USA. So these were really just for distribution across for English speaking people who were living um, throughout Europe, basically. Uh, so, and they're numbered. So this is number 20. And they did generally come in dust wrappers. Now, I've got some later on which are in dust wrappers, which we'll see. But we'll just go through these because, as I said, I've, it, this is that one of those sorts of publishers that I pick up the odd one here, the odd one there, in a little job lot, and then, but I've never ever set out to buy them. You know, I don't really collect these, but I've ended up with a collection of them, if that makes a, a sense. Um, and I've put them all together, and they do look quite nice when they are all together. These and some of the titles are absolutely fantastic. Now this has got a vintage dedication. I'm not sure what that says, but it says Leicester Square, January the 30th, 46. Keys or something like that. And another name at the top there, Lottie Spicky or something like that. <laughs> Don't mind the old vintage sort of um, inscription. Now, there's really not that's quite a clean sort of copy, that one. There were a couple of little bits on the back. The spine is flat, so there's nothing we can do there. But where I sort of pulled a little bit off, there was a, left a tiny little mark. Okay, that's, uh, that's all right. Now here's an author you probably recognize. This is C.S. Forrester. Um, Forrester wrote the Hornblower books. And this is actually the first one in the Hornblower series, uh, The Happy Return. This is number 29 in the Continental Library. And look at this, this is quite handy. Ah, now this is probably a remnant from the dust wrapper because we've got some in wrappers to, in fact, the very next one's in a wrapper, I think. See, so Captain Horatio Hornbell. There we are. So it's a bit about the book there. Then look, a listing of Zephyr books with number one being a farewell to arms. There we are. How interesting. So that lists the first 66 P.G. Woodhouse there, which we'll see in a minute. I've got a P.G. Woodhouse, which is probably quite rare. Quite a nice selection of titles there. Very nice indeed. Yes, yeah, so we'll put that to one side while we finish going through this one. It's got a bit of paint or something on the top edge there, but we're not going to be able to do much about that unless we were willing to... Uh, shave it down with some sandpaper. Number one book says Chester Walk Cheltenham. So this has gone into the second hand market. 1945 again. So I, I actually thought these, was, these were from the 30s, but um, it just shows, eh? These were all post-war. But that's okay. I think there's a lot more we can do on that one. So here's a yellow one, which uh, denotes the crime colors. Enter a murderer. H.A.M. Marsh. 
So let's slip this one out of its dust wrapper. Let's have a look at this first of all. It's a very bright yellow. And look, this is this is where that bit came from because it's got the list of the Zephyr books on the inside and outside flaps. This one lifts up to number 80 and it actually gives us the key there. So red volumes are, which we've got, well, modern American authors, blue, modern English authors, green is classics and yellow detective fiction and thrillers. So only the four subsections. So because this has been in a dust wrapper, it's really been, it's much, much cleaner than the other two we've seen. So it's really been uh, sort of protected. And just look at these, look how easy they are to read. They're really pleasing on the eye. I think they're great. Very, very nice, these. Really well put, to, well put together. And this has got an address, Erlin, wherever that was. So this was obviously sold on overseas and uh, not locally. So that's, uh, that's a very nice one, that actually. Just wrap her back on. Yeah, I say that's a pretty juicy one. That now we've got P.G. Woodhouse, another one of my favourite authors. This is, you know, Money in the Bank. This is pretty cool, isn't it? Sadly, not in a dust wrapper. Oh look, it's got a few vintage annotations here. Oh well, I don't mind. <laughs> I like PG Woodhouse, so oh, now look, we're going to need to get some glue in there. Look at that, it's just a little bit, it's coming away. This is number 33 in the series, so yeah, I think we're going to slip some glue down there. Um, just to stop that getting any worse, because I mean, it is PG Woodhouse. He's a, a very collectible author, even in paperback, particularly early paperbacks such as the East, so we want to preserve these as best we can. Of course, Woodhouse himself got a bit of a bad rap, didn't he, during the war? He uh, he sort of got tricked by the German propaganda machine. He was living in France, and obviously France got overrun. And, uh, you know, he was a complete um, pacifist. He wouldn't, you know, he didn't stand up to the Germans. He just sort of went along with it, and they... Uh, they popped him into a prison and eventually he started to be used for propaganda purposes and um, it wasn't his fault, but he was just very easily led, I think. And um, the British public thankfully forgave him. But for a while, he was a little bit of an outcast, which was a shame, you know, for such a popular author pre-war. But it was just bad luck more than anything. But he never really lost any of his sparkle right up until the end. I think he was writing right up until the mid to late 1960s before he passed away. So he had a very long life and he was highly, highly uh, prodigious with his output. I mean, just phenomenal, really. He never really stopped from the days of short stories right through to uh, at least at least one book a year, sometimes much, much more than that. Well, there we go. I think that's probably about as much as I can squidge in there. And it should be enough just to give that, that extra bit of security on the spine there. Yeah, there we are. I can see there's a lot of dust on the top of that one. I think I've had that wood house for quite some time. Dorothy Sayers, another crime one in the yellow colours here. Lord Peter. And that's Lord Peter Whimsey. He views the body. So let's slide it out of the wrapper first of all. It's very, very similar to the, uh, the one we saw just now, isn't it? This one lifts up to number 110. So the library is going on. Apart from that, there's no like printing information, like you know, reprints or this was first published in such and such a date. It's very much... I guess this is what they were like on the continent. Slightly smaller text on that one. Aha, uh -huh. so first published 1928, that would have been the original hardback. Copyright 1946. 
lovely underneath. It's a nice, nice clean copy of that one. Once again, the dust wrapper really has done its job and saved these books from uh, the ravages of time, really. Because even though these are 1947, I mean, that's still 75 years ago, isn't it? So uh, it's not like they're young. <laughs> They're still very old books. Let's slide those over there. Because what we'll do, we'll go through all these. And because we're not going to be able to polish any of the books that we've got today, because they're just so ancient, um, we'll, do, we'll do our sort of a brushing down session at the very end and we'll brush them all down. So here's a bit of a classic. Cranford. This is Gaskell. <laughs> Another one with very thick, thick pages. And this is number 66 in the library. It was Elizabeth Gaskell, isn't it? And actually, that's that's pretty tidy, all things considered. Consider it's not a, got a wrapper with it. That's actually not a bad, a bad copy. Now, this is interesting. So this is The Red, which was American authors, wasn't it? And this is William Faulkner's The Wild Palms. So another... Bit of a classic work, isn't it? This one, so it's like it's more like a maroon than a red, isn't it? Yeah, modern American authors, well, modern for when these were published, of course. Goes up to number 117. So I can imagine these are all sort of early or first printings because the, the number of books that are available seems to go. Uh, it seems to jump up with each volume. So this looks good. This looks got a nice vintage bookmark in, which we'll have a look at in a minute. Now I did spot there's a, a price on the inside here, which looks like uh, 350 francs, something like that. Three francs and 50 centimes what it looked like I was just put on by the pub, by the bookshop so I'm gonna happily get rid of that the rest of that's a really sort of nice copy now look at this look library library more or less the mill views ah so this was in France of course there we are. Look at that. 16 Avenue de Gaulle, which is in Paris. Lovely. That's really nice, isn't it? That's really, really nice, that one. I've got quite a collection of bookmarks in that, but to be honest, because this has come with this book, I'm not going to pull it out and put it with my sort of bookmark collection. I'll leave it because it's sort of part of this book's history, isn't it? And um, if I ever come to sell this book, that bookmark will go with it. It's like it's been a traveller all those years and uh, I think they should sort of stay together. Right, Elizabeth Bowen, to the north. And she wrote a few books, didn't she, at this period. Now this one's a little bit grubby. Yeah, got a little bit of staining and fingerprinty, so it's been read a few times by the look of it. Merlin Books, Hot Wood Yard, Hot Market Yard, Worcester. Got a little 10p at the top there, but I don't think it's not in pencil, this 10 pence, it's in the ink, I think. Yeah, sadly, we can't do anything about that. And the cover is very sort of grubby. There's the few bits on the front there. I'm just going to see if I can gently lighten those up a little bit, but. No, it's just going to leave a mark and it'll be in the whole cover will need it. But you can sort of see down the side here, it's got where the book has been held. That's picked up some some dirt. I'm very gently putting my rubber along the edge here. It will lighten that ever so slightly, but I don't want to end up having to do the entire cover because it's just, just not worth it for that little bit of the edge there now looks better than it did because it was almost sort of black wasn't it and it's just where the person's held the book naturally they've just opened it there they've been holding it in their hands and that's that's sort of where 
where it's got a bit dirty. This is a bit of a thin one, ah, but it's a good one though. Look, John Steinbeck, Mice and Men. I sadly forgot this one when I was doing my Steinbeck special. Look at that, the whole range there now, up to number 160. Wow. And what number is this? This is number 83. So maybe it's a reprint, or maybe they were just well ahead, I don't know. Of course, of Mice and Men's a very thin book, so uh, the pages are quite well spaced out here. An address in uh, Eindhoven, the bookseller's address, I think. Yeah, that's nice. Once again, the dust wrapper's done its thing. really dirty along the top so it's going to really benefit from having a good brush in a while. Here's another one, Tobacco Road, Erskine Coldwell. Number 86. Library, PVO Bartels. Yeah, pretty clean and robust copy of that one. Another Dorothy Sayers, The Unpleasantness at the Bologna Club. Now this was uh, pan, uh, Penguin number five in 1935. But see, it was released as a, a Zephyr. Zephyr 87. clean it's just going to be the top edge and even those aren't going to be mental it's not going to be crazy dusty but um, a couple of them are quite dark which uh, I think we'll uh, see a bit of plumes of smoke later on but a plumes of dust I should say but some of these aren't really too bad so this is one of the blue ones now these were for modern English authors I seem to recall yeah blue volumes modern English authors yeah and this dust wrapper is a little on the Slightly delicate side, look it's been held together by a couple of bits of tape, so not exactly ideal. So we'll treat that one with kid gloves. Let's have a look at this one. So this is uh, also got some wear down the bottom end of the, uh, the covers here. It's been in the wars a little bit this one. I'm going to pop a little bit of glue in the top there. So, uh, since I filmed the last video, which was the Puffin Storybooks, um, the channel has hit a thousand subscribers, so thank you very much everyone for that. Um, I'm glad we've uh, hit that milestone, it's really, really fantastic to do. I think in you know, YouTube's eyes now, although as we speak the channel is still under review, um to open up like community posts and things like that um i think in the long term it will mean that these videos will get a little bit more exposure than they've been getting at the moment um when you get to a thousand subscribers it's almost like um 
like a seal of approval in a funny sort of way that you are indeed who you say you are on the tin if you know what I mean <laughs> um, so hopefully the uh, the steady stream of su of subscribers you know one or two a day which is sort of what it is um, sometimes a bit more though I have to say this month it's been particularly busy we've had about three or four new subscribers every day which is fantastic um, but it will start you know slowly sort of organically growing and uh, well we'll see where it goes um, I am very much gonna have to start on my hardbacks quite soon because I don't really want to be boring you with um, uh, penguin and pelican and pan videos all the time but eventually you know I like to mix it up but eventually that's all I'll have left to do um, although saying that that is still an awful long way off I've got shelves and shelves of large sort of British annuals and large format books so although recently it's been very much paperback based there's loads more varieties still to come the land of spices Kate O'Brien number 111 it's got some markings there but they're in pen so nothing we can do about that it's got some splashes of coffee or something and once again we can't do anything about that either which is why I guess nice copies of these are probably quite scarce mm. Morning becomes Electra, Eugene O'Neill. Hmm. Another author I'm not a hundred percent sure I've ever heard of anything by them before. But that's just a nice clean unwrapped copy, so that's quite nice. Ooh, this looks like a nice one. Raymond Chandler, look at that, the big sleep. He's a quite a collectible author. In the yellow again. Detective fiction and thrillers. A little bit of wear on the inner and outer spine, but nothing too bad. I'd imagine that's uh, really kept the actual book in nice condition. Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? Number 148 from 1947. My suspicion is that would probably be quite an expensive book to buy second hand if you were looking for that particular one. You'd probably have to pay a few a few shillings for that one, I would imagine. Now this looks like a big thick one. Captain from Castile. Volume 1, and I see I've got Volume 2 there as well. So, two-parter. I'm seeing one of these. There we are, number 153. And I'm guessing number 154. We'll have a look in a moment. Nice and bright underneath, isn't it? Map inside there. It's nice, nice copy that one. And here's uh, volume two of that one. Same thing, and it is consecutive numbering. List up to number 160 now. Some fantastic authors, I guess they had the they could just choose the cream of the crop for overseas releases, couldn't they? 
Well, I'm assuming they all fit all got paid, but sometimes you never can tell, can you? I think this is the biggest one we've seen today, Edmund Wilson, Memoirs of Eckert County. Now, the bottom of the spine is, well, the dust wrapper is there in pieces. So let's uh, get that out of the equation first of all. <laughs> let's have a little look at it. Uh, held together by some ancient tape. So the pieces are there, but it certainly uh, is the worst for wear, isn't it? But we'll leave it as is. I suppose in a way it's managed to keep the book perhaps cleaner than it would have been without it. It's still a little dusty. It's quite a big thick one as well, this. So as much as it looked a bit of a dog, and it is a dog, It's about as good as it's going to get, <laughs> believe it or not. I could obviously pull the dust wrapper to bits, but um, it would just mean it wouldn't be on there at all, you know, so <laughs> we'll just leave it like that. To be honest, it's one of those ones I'm half tempted to take it off. It's so tatty. I'm half tempted to take it off and just uh, have it in my dust wrapper box, you know, my fragments of dust wrappers. Henry James, the Aspern paper, is a much better copy of this. So. Next to last one of these is number 158. Really, really nice and tight underneath. Yeah, that's lovely, 1947. Still only numbered up to number 160, so I wonder if that was it. That was the run, 160 and out. That was number 158. This is my last one, which is number 214, so that's for that the theory. 211 rather, completely to bed. So this has numbering inside up to number 229. There are only so many ways to have and have not. Well, there we go. So it's at least up to 229. But this is my tail end, 1211. My highest number. This is 1948. Quite an interesting little publisher this and uh, as I said I've never ever gone out of my way to collect them but this is what I've managed to pick up or has come my way in sort of the last 20 or so years when I've decided to keep them. I think I ended up keeping them simply because there were so many uh, like key authors in there, people like the, the PG Woodhouses and the CS Foresters and the crime authors of course. Now this is uh, my one of two touch knits editions and there's absolutely thousands of these and um this is another continental library that started in the late 1800s like 1880 or something like that i believe um they published all the conan Doyle sherlock holmes's and they're slightly smaller format and oblong once again you see not to be introduced into the british empire or the usa so for english-speaking people living throughout continental Europe and uh, soft covers very very this is May 1932 <laughs> this particular one um, and that's interesting what it says on the back because I've read this about this publisher so every volume of the touch Nits edition is published with the continental copyright acquired directly by purchase from the author or his representative. So, although these were published on the continent, the author definitely uh, received their um, commission, as it were. Um, and this is the only other one I've got, which is uh, D. H. Lawrence, an author I don't mind. Um, Sons and Lovers, and uh, D. H. Lawrence, you know, 
he was an author. Some of his stuff was only published continent in Europe, continental Europe, until it got um, wider publication um, in the UK by people like um, Sir Alan Lane pushing the boat out at Penguin. And this is a very, very sort of tatty one compared to the other one here. What does this say there? That is in a completely foreign language. But I can look at 16th August 34, maybe 38. Very old tatty copy, this one, to be honest, but I suppose it is a, a D.H. Lawrence, so. <laughs> but not a lot I can do about that, I'm afraid to say. Now, I do have one later one from the top snitches, which is this, which is their tail end sort of ones. This one's numbered number 13, but it's. Uh, this is a possibly wartime or post-war. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Nineteen forty-nine. Yeah, it's post-war. Hmm. Transport. It's like getting a taxi. <laughs> Who'd have thought it? Oh, we'll stick that in there. Often you find bus tickets and stuff like that, don't we? Now this is one odd one which has ended up in this particular lot. I haven't, this is the only one I've got. It's a Samson Low Sixpenny. That was the series. West of the Rio Grande. So it's a, a Western. It's the only one of these I've got. It's in a dust wrapper. It's underneath it's actually quite, quite bright. Not as well made as the paper inside is very, very poor quality. It's not like a penguin. But it's one of those little ones that was around the time of the penguins. It's got a very thin dust wrapper. But mentions uh, look, the Rupert Little Bear Library. Wow. There's a list of them on the back there. Oh, same ones. Yeah, so that's quite nice. The fact that it's in a dust wrapper is rare. I can't imagine there's too many that have survived in that condition. But look at the dirt on the top. So nothing we can do really internally, but out externally, um, at least along the top, we're going to be able to give it a bit of a tartan up. So this is the first of the Muth and Six Pennies, and this is number one in the series. And I've got eight of these out of the 20 that got produced. At least I think there's 20. Um, I don't have anything past that, um, but we'll check the final volume just to see if the numbering goes past number 20. This is published 1939, and I am certain, once again, that these were just put out um, in competition with the success that Penguin Books were having pre pre-war you know i'm sure that's what that was the reason so it was number one this is uh number four here and i tend to pick up one of these because i've on the i've always got on the lookout for them i've got saved searches on ebay but it seems to be the same ones that turn up in again and again but i pick up maybe one a year of these if you can believe it so i'd love to um to finish the set if if indeed 20 is the set um but um i've only got these uh, these eight to show you today this is number six this one's actually in a wrapper so it's quite quite nice and bright underneath which is nice isn't it some good titles here like number five i haven't got that one sam the sun i said this is number six we got a sax roma there number 10 he's the fu manchu author I'm imagining those two would be quite sought after. The uh, the PG Woodhouse would be lovely, wouldn't it? And this is in a wrapper. So this one's actually got its original wrapper here. The quality of the wrapper is like a penguin wrapper of that time. Same sort of thickness. Here 
is number number 12, The Silent Partner. And because war is kicking in, the pages aren't quite as thick anymore. Mufin, like all the other publishers, had to uh, rein it in and print on thinner and thinner paper. This is 1939 now, so Britain was at war. But they're really nice, sort of clean design on these. Number 13, Arnold Bennett, The Price of Love. And they list up to number 16. There's an interesting title, Jonathan Latimer. He's an author that's pretty good. He's another crime writer. I read one of his uh, last year. Really, really good. He only wrote about four books, and I think I've, uh, I've got most of them. They were published by Pan over here. That was number 13. And number 15 now. And this one's in a in a wrapper. So we'll slide that out a moment. Oh, it's got a name on the front there. W.B. Taylor. Okay. This one is one of the more common ones. See this one quite a bit. I said when they turn up online, they're generally quite cheap. Booth and Sixpenny. So I wouldn't pay much more than a tenner for each one if it was in absolutely top condition. Although maybe a little bit more, I would imagine, for the PG Woodhouse. That's one that I would expect to sell for you know, £20 or something like that. John G. Brandon, West End. It's number 17 now. And they list up to number 20 again. Good stuff. Quite an interesting list, isn't it? And I see some of the earlier ones, like the Woodhouse, have disappeared. So I wonder... If it had the print run, they just couldn't afford to do a reprint. They just didn't have the paper allowance, and they were already committed to publishing these. There we are. It, you know, they just feel different in the hand. They're nowhere near as nice as the early ones. And this is the last one I've got, which is number 20. And look, it's the last one listed on the back. I think they only ever did 20. I, I'm confident that there's no more than that. But if you know differently, do please uh, let me know. This is 1940 now. And uh, him tune mystery, and by that time Britain was really sort of up against it, wasn't it, during the war? And uh, yeah, I don't know. A nice little series, fun to collect because when you do get one, you really feel like you've found a rarity. <laughs> at least that's how I feel it. So the last little batch of books we're looking at today are the Toucan novels, and uh, I really like these, but once again they hardly ever turn up. Um, I believe they were published as part of the Hutchinson Group. I believe. It's one of their weird offshoots, which went, I think there was about 100, 150. Not a lot more than that. It says Stanley Pool & Co. Underneath. Hmm. Not 100% sure, but this is number one. Although it lists the first eight on the back, so I'm not sure if that was the first eight that were released in one hit or... Uh, if this was a reprint, they often don't say. But I pick these up regardless of what it says printing history-wise because they're scarce. You don't often see them. Once again, uh, this is number three. Very much a penguin competitor. And as we'll see in a minute, they come in different colours for different genres and writing styles and stories. pretty scarce you know they were around for a little while but you just never see them today uh, number eight the unobtainable the authors aren't exactly they got you know like most, any little publisher they'll have a few authors who've got a bit of longevity but in a lot of cases these are a list made up of obscure obscure names number eight it's number nine here HME clamp. I mean, let's be honest, you know. I think Golden Rod, I think this is the first one I ever had as a toucan. I remember thinking, what on earth is this? What a, they're such an unusual curiosity, aren't they? Yeah, Hurst and Blackett. I was convinced they were part of the Hutchinson group, but evidently not. Number 12 here. Vista the Dancer. And these came with dust wrappers as well, a bit like the penguins. But 
None of my early ones have got wrappers with them. They've been lost over the years, sadly. The formula. This is quite ropey as well. Yeah, I'm going to get some glue in there. What a mess that is. Jeez, look. There's bits of the uh, cracking off in my hand here. Oh, oh dear. It's very, very messy indeed. I'm going to get the old scalpel in that one. So if I can just clean it out a little bit and then um, sort of re-glue it. Ugh. What a mess. It's just the glue has just aged really badly. And before you re-glue it, you want to just sort of get rid of any loose stuff, which is what this is doing. Then I'll smear some fruit stick in there. There, jeez Louise. This is gonna be a bit of an ugly process, I'm afraid, but it needs to be done because that cover is gonna fall right off. Now. So, I just got big blobs of blue tack here, and we just sort of squirt it in. Or smear it in, I should say, right down to the bottom of the spine. It's come, it's come away the complete length here. So, but it doesn't take very long to uh, to go in right along the uh, the full length there. Bits of book falling out on me. So I was thinking next week, while I'm blowing this in, um, I might pull out some hardbacks, some of which sort of have been cleaned, but they need a dust. Others which haven't been cleaned, um, but need protective dust wrapping put on them. So uh, I might give that a go next week. I'll see how we get on um, during the week see if I get some time to do it because it's going to be a little bit more fiddly than usual and it does when you put the dust wrappers into like plastic wrap it you need plenty of room so I might need to um re-jig the studio ever so slightly uh, for that but that's okay because I got some other sorts of videos where I need to redo the, the studio coming up and so that might be a really good time to do it. So look out for that in the next sort of week. It'll either be next week or the week after. I'm going to be doing uh, doing one of those. So I think it's not perfect by any means, but because the book's got spine roll as well. But I think it's about as good as it's going to get. <laughs> All right. Now here's one actually in a wrapper. Chicane, number 20. This is the possibly the only one I've got in a wrapper, in actual fact. So, on the back here, it's interesting that it's now John Lane, John Long Limited. The Toucan novels in association with John Long Limited, sixpence, exactly the same as the Penguins. And most of the paperback publishers of this period, now they did have an Edgar Wallace, so that was perhaps one of the few recognizable names. And look at this, because it's been protected in a wrapper, underneath it's actually uh, really nice compared to the other ones. Still got some staining inside, so it looks like it's got wet at some point. Even so, nice and sharp. 
in comparison to uh, the other ones we've been looking at. And you can see, looking at them there, all the different colours, how, once again, so many of the publishers decided to do colour coding. It seemed to just be the way, didn't it? Here's a yellow one, so first yellow one we've seen. Thanks to Dr. Molly. Ah, Dr. Molly. Okay, number 43. Number 44, The Singing Spider. Angus McVicker. This one's really falling to bits. Very, very fragile this one but not a great deal I can do there it's already as good as it's going to get really 62 the 13th crime nice wartime advert there for Cabris if it's chocolate then it's food Okay, I seem to remember that had that one a long time as well. That's possibly one of my early ones. Clacking shuttles. Hmm. See, look at this. Look, the Toucan novels, and then on the back, an advert for Hutchinson's Pocket Library. So I think somehow at some point these Toucans ended up as part of the Hutchinson group. I note with interest that there's no number. And the price is one and six. It's gone up from sixpence. So this is obviously later, after the other books that we've seen. But something has definitely changed in the publishing because they're now part of part of Hutchinson by the look of it. So I wonder if Hutchinson just bought them out, maybe. And then amalgamated them possibly into the Hutchinson Pocket Library, which we've already seen. And here's another one, same thing, this is one in six. But on the back, look, an advert for Hutchinson's Pocket Library. So that's where they definitely ended up. And I think that's why we don't see many more past the uh, sort of hundred or so that we've, you know, that I think came out. And the very last one I've got here is a uh, a rare um, services edition Toucan. So it says the Toucan novels at the top, but importantly, services edition. Now, these are rare. Um, these are just printed exclusively for armed forces, British armed forces, you know, fighting forces of the Allied nations. And these would have been printed and then sent off to uh, uh, soldiers during the war. Simple as that. So this is 119C, so that was possibly the regiment. Received PRI, it was the 2nd Battalion Devonshire Regiment. There we are. So this actually went to, uh, this is X, X Regimental Library, which is really cool, isn't it? So where has this been and whose hands did it go through? Um, did it get read many times? I don't know. It's in pretty nice condition, isn't it? Dirty top there, but... I love a service edition, I really, really do. So there we are, that's all the books that we're gonna be looking at today. Um, now, I just need to give them all a really good brush down along the top. So that's what we're gonna do right now. Right then, so I've got all the books ready to be uh, brushed down. usual it'll be the top edges that are going to be the dirtiest to get cleaned.
thing is with these, they're so heavy, I need to, uh, you can't do too many at once. <laughs> but so far, not a massive amount of dust coming off them, which is a good sign. They're not covered up or anything in my bookcase. They're uh, you know, in the uh, collection room. and square well, they're quite fun to collect even if I'm not really collecting them per se Hmm. Ah, that's the top of the dust wrapper there. I was thinking maybe the top of the sp like the top of the spine of the book had got a caught, but it's not. It was just the uh, just the dust wrapper. Lovely moose and six pennies. A bit of dust coming off there, as expected. <sighs> yes. <sighs> wow. <laughs> Give this 
same with these because they're quite dirty along the top there. Being quite thorough with these just to make sure I get the absolute every bit off and uh, those are much much better than they were I mean they, these were particularly bad I have to say they really were but they have definitely lightened up and it's the tail end ones that came out that were published tail end of the, the, um, the run I mean that came out under sort of wartime conditions that have um, ultimately aged the worst, really. So we've got some more toucans now. A big toucan library. I'd like to get some more of these if I could, but they just seem so hard to track down. You know, I'd, I don't actively go to collect them, but when I find them, I'm always really pleased that I found another one. Because they just... Uh, they're nowhere near as plentiful as uh, some sort of vintage imprints, you know. Right. Quite a bit of dust on the side there, which is unusual. Good. They look much better. So I hope uh, you've enjoyed looking through. Not my usual sort of thing, but these all need cleaning. They're all part of my collection. And uh, these are some of the, amongst the very earliest, oldest paperbacks I've got, really. So they had to be cleaned. They do look much better for it. <sighs> Obviously, if you have enjoyed it today, do please drop a, a thumbs up. And if you've really enjoyed it, leave a comment. That would be cool. As I said, I've not quite decided what we're going to do next week yet. But certainly the hardbacks, or some of the hardbacks, are on the horizon now. Not that I've got so many hardbacks, of course, but I've got some, so... Anyway, thanks very much for watching today, and I shall of course see you next Saturday with another video. Bye.